Hey everyone, Duke Nugget 3D here with another gas mask related review, but today we're not doing a review of a particular mask, but rather a set of accessories that was standard for most American gas masks throughout the late period of the Second World War into probably the early 50s, but that might be pushing a little bit, but nevertheless, what we have here are some late World War II U.S. gas mask accessories. Uh, not really too much history to discuss. It's sort of more history into each individual piece of equipment. And as we go along, I'm going to be showing you how they are typically stored in the respective carrier, in this case being a M6 carrier for the M3 and M4 series lightweight service masks. So where do we begin? Let's start with the M5 ointments, because this is the one that I don't really have that much of. I actually do have the original ointments that are from this, but they are currently removed and in storage right now because they stink to high hell. Um, normally, throughout World War II, the main protective ointment kit that would be issued is the M4 protective ointment, which is basically a large cart, not really large, but a cardboard box uh, containing a single gray tube of the M4 ointment, and there would be a separate ointment, the British anti-lewisite or BAL eye ointment, which would be applied to the eyes if lewisite or similar blister agents would get into contact with them. Now, later on, they upgraded the M4 kit as the M5, where it was four separate tubes inside a little metal container here, which had all the instructions it needed to uh, on how to basically prevent uh, uh, blister agent contamination on the skin and clothing, and these could also be used for decontaminating pr uh, field equipment and removing chemical agents from the skin, so on and so forth. And these also were supplied with a set of, uh, or, or a single tube of British anti lewisite eye ointment in the inside of the cap. As you can see, there's a little indent there for the tube, um, but really not much to say about that. This one isn't poor condition. You can see the hole right here where there was originally a lot of rust basically eating through the metal. And I basically just took a Dremel and rounded that out to make sure it isn't as jagged. And I didn't really need to do that, but I just felt it would help preserve the metal a little bit more by getting rid of the loose ends and corrosion. And I've rust treated everything, but um, essentially it's easy to find these tins on their own. And I probably should have gotten the ointments out to show you what they look like. I might do that in a later review. Um, but for now I'm just keeping them in storage for the time being. Um, and you'll get to see them at a later date, I'm sure. So moving along, what we have here is the gas detection and de personal decontamination instruction card, which basically details everything you're supposed to do for specific gases and protection and first aid, just general things to know about being in a chemical attack. And this one is dated January 4th, 1944. Um, this is an original one. It is getting quite hard to find these. I know there are a few reproductions out there made by um, the 10th Armored Division uh, reenactor company, but I, I might get some more of those in the future. I have an original here just to show. Um, the next thing up is the protective Individ the individual protective covers, which, as you all probably know, if you know anything about U.S. World War II gas masks, is that they were a, basically a giant trash bag with a clear top that was essentially meant to go over the entire body and the field equipment, and the you, it allowed you to stick a rifle out the corner to fire at passing aircraft, and these were mostly meant for spray protection. Um, and I'm not opening these ones. I have I got a ton of these. I got literally like seven of these and I have them scattered about through all my various protective mask kits from the Second World War and I have two of them. Two of these each were ish each issued with the um, any standard service mask kit. So I have I was, naturally I have two of them. Next up is the M1 eye shields which were basically clear or tinted plastic goggles that basically were intended to protect against spray attacks when a full protective mask was not needed or something or other like that. These were almost never used. Uh, they were, More often than not these were used as rudimentary sun dust and wind goggles and they uh, I'm, I might pull a couple out just to show you just what they look like. I'm not going to snap them together on camera, unfortunately, because while I can actually do that, I, I don't want to undo them because it's a very finicky process to make sure not to damage the vinyl material here. But as you can see, they're, I basically have all of them, and they're in very good condition. I have also I have a, uh, a better condition set of these where that vinyl is still very flexible and able to be applied into place without risk of damaging it. But... Um, obviously that's not the case with this set, so I'm not going to do it on camera. And it basically just has information about what to do if you get contaminated and so on and so forth. Next up is the 
anti-dimming cloth. These became more common than the anti-dimming sticks, although both were used throughout World War II. Um, and basically nothing much to say. It's just a tacky cloth that basically prevents fogging of the lenses when in use. Nothing much to say about that. Uh, next up is an accessory that was pretty much only for the lightweight series masks, and that is the C3 waterproofing kit, which consisted of a length of hemp cord, which on one end had a neoprene plug. In this case, this one is dated 1945, made by Sieberling Rubber Company, as is the case with most of the ones that I see. I haven't actually seen any others that are made by any different companies. And on the other length, um, there was a hose clamp, which basically cinched the corrugated hose shut so that no water would enter the canister through the face piece and obviously the plug went on the inlet valve of the canister itself and there was a instruction a laminated instruction card supplied that told you how to take care of your mask after fording a river and you know how to waterproof it care of the mask after wetting so on and so forth nothing much to say about that um, and the next accessory um, i'll get to the m6 carrier in a moment when showing you how to put the accessories in is on the face piece itself because as you can see I have a set of optical inserts inside the mask, which I'll get to in a moment, but first, um, actually I'll show off the hood. I bet you notice this hood here. This is, this doesn't really have any official designation other than hood wool protective. And it is essentially just a wool chemical hood that is impregnated with specific um, chemicals that are neutral, that neutralize gas when it, you know, chemical agents come into contact with it. And these are, Pretty common to find. Unfortunately, they've gone up in price significantly lately due to the success of the movie Fury, where there was a character who has one draped over his M1 helmet, which I doubt is the actual applicable method of using that, to say the least. But nevertheless, these have these were previously going at a rate of like 20 to 30 bucks, and after Fury and just in recent years in general, they've been springing up between 40 to 70 dollars, and I've even seen them as high as 100 dollars, which is absolutely ridiculous considering how common these are. But nevertheless, I have one here to show off. I actually just got this today, um, and I will unbutton it to show you the various details. These unbutton from the front with three standard buttons. And I will undo this, and you can see there is a bit of elasticated wool around the face seal of the mask itself. And this is leaving a bit of smudging on the face piece because of the tackiness. On the inside of the hood, you can see there is a sort of a, a cotton lining, and there really isn't too much else to see. Other than this right here, this little tab with two button loops on it is actually meant to coincide with the... the uh, herringbone twill one-piece coveralls or a modified set of the herringbone twill two-piece fatigue uniforms because often the case was is that the herringbone twill uniforms were used as a impromptu permeable protective suit which had the same neutral gas neutralizing chemicals applied to this hood applied to those clothing and so this would be worn with either the herringbone twill fatigues or coveralls with the collar turned up there would be two tack buttons on the back that this would attached to and when the whole assembly was worn in the ready position this would this hood would be attached at all times and basically thrown over the head whenever their uh, the, the mask was required and put on so now let's get into the optical inserts here which um retro respirators um was very kind of sent to me as part of a restoration deal i'm doing for them I'm, I'm gonna be doing a video on that in a moment not a full restoration video but just kind of filling in you in with the details because i unfortunately i just don't have the the uh, equipment to do restoration videos anymore. I don't have the, I don't have a very good setup at the moment. But anywho, I'm dig uh, I digress. So let's get on to the optical inserts, which um, are the pretty typical type. You can see the still has the box here made by Bausch and Lamb. I'm probably butchering that designation, and it still has all the issuing information. This was issued to someone, apparently a George Graham. And let's see, there's a date here. I can't tell if that's 47 or it says 917. Um, I can't really tell. I haven't looked too far into it, so, and then obviously there's a store label on it, which was very unfortunate to have, but whatever, it is it is what it is, adds a little bit of history, I guess. And I'm not going to remove them from the face piece, but from, you should be able to tell that they are simply a wire insert with a spectacle frame on the inside that would hold spectacles, obviously, and they retain themselves pretty well inside the mask on their own. And presumably they would just kind of center themselves around where your eyes are going to be. And I'll give you a qu another quick look on the interior to show those off. Hopefully you can see those pretty well. I don't really know how I could uh, show those off any better, but they're there. So now that that's out of the way, I will show you how the individual accessories were stored in the M6 carrier. 
First off, let's open up the carrier. Opens with three lifted out uh, snaps as standard. Remove the straps. Got the waist cord strap or the yeah the waist strap here, and then you have the shoulder strap like so. Remove that. First things first are the canister straps. Where is the other one? Well, apparently there's just one in this one. That's interesting. Don't really see that all too often. So let's get the C3 waterproofing kit out of the way and just slip the M10A1 canister right on through that strap. It's a little bit tricky sometimes, but with a little bit of finagling, you can get it on through fairly easily. And the, can the carrier is worn at your left side, so the back of the canister would be facing, uh, or the inlet of the canister would be facing the rear. And the mask, and forgive me if I'm handling a little bit roughly, this is a very awkward position behind the camera, it would basically sit in there like so. The waterproofing kit uh, would sort of just be tucked off to the side, such as this. I normally like to keep them in one of these pockets, but I'll explain what these pockets are for in a moment. And then the face piece is essentially curled around and stuffed in like so. Just like that. And as for the accessories, starting with the individual protective covers, one each would be supplied in the far right pocket and the center pocket, which I will demonstrate here. Those just slip right in. And there's really nothing much to say about that. The pocket on the far left here is actually reserved for the M4 protective ointment and British anti-leucite eye ointment, and not really the later M5 ointments. As you can see, they don't really fit in there all that well. They'd be they fit better in here. I haven't read through any technical manuals that says how to store the M the M5 and M5A1 ointments in a lightweight service mask carrier. So I would presume that you would sort of stick them somewhere down here, maybe. Uh, that's my best guess, really. I have really no clue where else to put them because obviously they don't they don't fit in this tall, thinner pocket designed for the M4 ointment. Uh, no repros are made of those. Um, the gas instruction card, I don't really know where these fit either. Um, they could be either stuck with the um, the individual protective cover, or what I like to do is I stick them in the M1 eye shields where they're more protected in here and um, they're not as risk of getting bent up and damaged in that way. They're just all where they need to be. And as for the eye shields, you could probably either store them in the center pocket as well. Although the official um, technical bulletins say that they're stuck right next to the face piece, like so. And for the last piece of kit, the anti-dimming cloth, there is a small pocket, obviously, on the bottom um, left-hand side on the back towards you, which I can't really access because I forgot to put it in there at first. But just believe me when I say there's a little fabric loop in there. And then the whole assembly would be closed up with the three snaps like so, if you give me one moment here. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, this would probably be a lot easier if I was off camera and was able to shift things around, but you have to kind of have to deal with what you got. But believe it when I say that all fits in there, it's very tight and I'm not gonna finagle with it on camera for an hour. So just, you get the idea of what it is. So that's pr basically all there is to say about World War II gas mask accessories. Majority of these were phased out by the late 1950s and uh, they are very common typically except for the um, optical inserts um, those would pretty much those kind of come and go so you can find them sometimes you can't and they typically stay around the um, probably around the 30 to 70 dollar range it, it really varies sometimes but anyways i'm rambling again so if you have any comments questions corrections or concerns drop them down in the comments below apologies if i missed anything and I'm, i'll see you all later